So this is the third uh, in the Rethinking Existentialism series, and this film is about uh, Maurice Merleau-Ponty's criticism of Sartre's existentialism. Merleau-Ponty was a, a good friend of Sartre and Beauvoir, uh, had been ever since they were students together in the late 1920s. Um, in 1945, they founded a journal together, Les Temps Modernes, uh, and all three of them were editors of that journal until uh, 1952, when there was a big fight and Merleau Ponty left. Um, but I'm not going to talk about that. I'm going to talk about um, uh, an earlier um, disagreement uh, over the nature of uh, human motivation and the nature of freedom. Um, so in 1945, uh, Merleau Ponty published The Phenomenology of Perception, and the last chapter of that huge book uh, is entitled Freedom, and it's um, an account of uh, uh, the nature of motivation and the, the, the kind of human freedom that uh, Merleau-Ponty thinks that we have. And he, but it's also uh, largely a criticism of, of Sartre's theory of motivation and freedom, which he had published two years earlier in Being and Nothingness. Um, Merleau-Ponty develops his own view through criticizing various aspects of Sartre's view. Now, I think that um, Melo Ponti has got Sartre all wrong, um, I think, he, on this matter. I think he has failed, his criticism of Sartre fails because it doesn't correctly identify Sartre's position in the first place. Um, and I'll say a lot more about that in the course of this film. Um, but in short, this is what Melo Ponti thinks Sartre thinks. Okay. Merleau-Ponty thinks that Sartre thinks that the uh, structures of meaning that we find in our experience, uh, the, the, the meaning and order and structure that we experience the world as having is entirely dependent on our own projects. That's what Merleau-Ponty thinks is Sartre's position. Um, and then Merleau-Ponty thinks that that's just wrong. Uh, the, it, it, Sartre is right that we don't just experience the world as a mass of objects or a mass of stuff, that we ex do experience it as having a kind of meaningful uh, structure and order to it. But that that structure, says Merleau-Ponty, um, is in fact uh, provided by our physical capabilities in relation to the physical structure of the world around us. And our position in the social fabric and the and the and the uh, limitations that that brings with it. Um, so he thinks uh, that Sartre is just wrong to think that the the, the structures uh, of our experience are based on our projects. Um, I'll give you a couple of examples of that. So one example is that uh, Merleau Ponty talks about climbing a mountain, and he says, look, you know. Um, one mountain will seem more climbable than another mountain purely as a result of your own, as a climber, physical size and shape and uh, physical abilities um, uh, and your level of fitness. Right? And, and this is um, something that contemporary now uh, empirical psychology um, thinks uh, is finding evidence for. So, you know, if you're the more tired you are, the steeper the hill that you're walking up seems to you. Right? If it physically uh, looks steeper um, as a result of you being more tired. Um, but Merleau Ponty thinks that there's uh, that it's not just the, the, the physical relationship with the environment that changes the way we perceive it in that way. It's also our social position in the environment. So your social class or your gender or your uh, ethnicity or your geographical position in relation to um, your social environment. All of these things will make a difference to the opportunities that are available to you, to the way things seem to you, to the, to the um, meanings and uh, structure that your environment takes on around you um, and the pathways that you can find through that environment and the pathways that you would like to take but that seem blocked to you. Um, now here's the odd thing, Merleau-Ponty um, uh, as I say, has misunderstood Sartre. Sartre's being a nothingness um, actually agrees with Merleau-Ponty about those things. 
right? There's, there are pl plenty of passages in Being and Nothingness where Sartre talks explicitly about the um, uh, social structure of the world um, and the, the, the meanings and, and order that we find there as a result of our own position within the social order. Um, and there are passages too where he talks about the, the uh, physical uh, meanings that we find in the world, things being too difficult or, or uh, uh, impossible for us to do, the resistance, the coefficient of adversity, as he sometimes calls it, in objects in the world, their resistance to our attempts uh, to do things um, as, uh, as a result of the limitations of our own physical capacities. So, you know, this stuff that Melaconti points out is all already there in being a nothingness. And Sartre doesn't think uh, in being a nothingness that that is dependent on our projects. He thinks it's exactly the same as Melaconti thinks. It's dependent on our physical capabilities and our social position. So if that's right, then what does Sartre think is dependent on our projects? And this is where um, it's important to see that Sartre is really talking about two different kinds of things when he's talking about the structure of the world around us. He's talking about those social and physical order and structure, or what I've been calling meanings in the world. But he also thinks that overlaying on that, there is a structure of reasons, okay, where reasons, that's not his word for it, and he doesn't really have a, a consistent term for it, but this is certainly there in being a nothingness in, in various, uh, under the guise of various terms. Um, uh, so he thinks, what, what are reasons? Well, reasons are um, uh, more than just what something means or what it is or how it's structured or how it's ordered. They are um, reasons for behaving one way or another. They are things to take into consideration. They are things that have a certain directive significance. Okay, so um, uh, a reason will direct you to, to do something or, to, or, or not to do something. Um, so to give an example, um, or a couple of examples actually. So one example that Sartre gives is, is a sign that says, keep off the grass, right? So imagine you're in a formal garden or park and there's a little sign on the lawn that says, keep off the grass. And that is a social and physical object, right? I mean, obviously it's a physical sign. It's a social sign. It's, it's got a meaning that is given by the words that are written on it and language is a social construct. The, the, the authority that that sign has to tell you to keep off the grass is itself a matter of its place in a social structure, right? Um, but oh, do all of those things amount to a reason for you to not walk on the grass? Well, that depends on your projects, Sartre thinks. That depends on your values. Now, if you want to conform and fit in in this particular environment, in this particular day, um, then yeah, that's a reason not to walk on the grass. But on the other hand, if you're in a particularly defiant or rebellious mood, that sign might be experienced precisely as a reason to walk on the grass. Right? Um, this other example on the same page is, is an alarm clock. Um, uh, so when the alarm clock rings, you know that means the meaning it has is that it's time to get up. Right? That's a uh, that's a social meaning. Somebody sometime invented alarm clocks. If your alarm clock rings, that's an alarm clock that I know you went out and bought, somebody gave you, I, you know, you set the time, you set the alarm, you decided that that's the time for the alarm to ring and, and it has that social meaning that now it's time to get up. Is that a reason for you to get out of bed at that time? Well, that depends on your projects, right? That depends on uh, what it is that you want to do that morning um, and how important, and this is, this is the other thing, it depends on how important that thing is to you. So, you might, uh, it's, it's not just a matter of whether the alarm clock is a reason or not uh, to get out of bed. It's a matter of how strong a reason it is to get out of bed. And how strong a reason it is for you to get out of bed depends on how important those things are that you're intending to do that morning. Okay, so that's the difference between meanings and reasons. Social and physical meanings get transformed into reasons for action uh, as a result of your projects. The kind of reasons that they are and the strength of reasons that they are is dependent on your projects. And that's what Merleau-Ponty has entirely missed about Sartre. Right? Merleau-Ponty thinks that Sartre thinks it's the meanings 
that are dependent on your projects. And then Merleau-Ponty points out that, they, that that's just false. Sartre doesn't think that. Sartre agrees that the meanings are dependent on your physical and social environment, but he thinks that they are not in themselves reasons for your action, and that reasons are dependent on your projects. So, as I said earlier, this amounts to a difference between the two in the theory of freedom, right? So, Merleau-Ponty thinks that freedom is just a matter of degree, and it's, a, and it's a matter of how much your environment does or does not allow you to pursue the particular uh, uh, goals that you have, right, to act on your desires. So he thinks that, you know, your desires come from your nature, you're born a certain way, and then you're raised a certain way, and, in, and, and you interact with your environment a certain way as you grow up and mature. And this produces uh, the particular kind of desires and goals that you have in life. Um, and then there's the social and physical environment, which may facilitate those goals or some of them. It may frustrate those goals or some of them. For some people, it facilitates all of their goals. They can, they can do whatever they like because of their position in the social order and because of their physical fitness. But for other people, maybe at the other end of the scale, are very uh, constrained by their physical environment and social environment, and they are a lot less free. Thanks, Merleau-Ponty. And he thinks that's the only sense of the word freedom. Now, Sartre obviously is going to agree with that to some extent. He doesn't think that your desires are, are innate or, or that simply caused by your upbringing. He thinks that they're manifestations of your projects. But he'll agree that you know some people are more free than others in the sense that some people have uh, have uh, a, a greater ability to, to pursue their goals than others as a result of their um, differing environments. But he also thinks that there's a metaphysical sense of freedom. There's a kind of inner freedom, a kind of freedom of mind, um, which is the freedom over those projects. Because you can set your goals or reset your goals, because you can change your values and pursue new values, think Sartre, um, then you, you know you do have a kind of mastery over the roots of your behaviour and the roots of your outlook. So the reasons the world seems to you the way it does is not just because of the social and physical meanings that it presents you with, it's because of the reasons that it presents you with. And those reasons are what they are, only as a result of the projects that you have control over. And it's that control that Sartre thinks is the core of human freedom. And that, incidentally, is also what he means when he says that existence precedes essence. Right? The essence of any given individual, such as they have one, is the set of projects which forms their experience, which shapes their outlook, which makes the world look to them as a certain set of reasons rather than a different set of reasons, and which uh, uh, is something that they have control over and can shape and can change. So that is why Merleau-Ponty's um, theory of freedom may be a supplement to some extent to Sartre's, but the way in which he um, develops it doesn't work as an argument against Sartre's theory of freedom because it hasn't engaged really with the cent central claims of Sartre's theory of freedom at all. And Merleau-Ponty has overlooked the difference between meanings and reasons and thinks that Sartre's talking about meanings when he's talking about reasons. But there's a second thing, um, which is that Sartre gives us uh, an argument for uh, his idea that reasons um, are uh, experienced as things that we can um, override it, it, the things that ultimately we have control of. Um, and that comes out of his idea that, that that's just what it is for a reason to be a reason or to figure as a reason in your experience. So when the signboard tells you to keep off the grass or the alarm clock tells you it's time to get up in the morning, what makes that a reason in your experience is precisely that it doesn't simply cause your action. It doesn't force you to do anything at all. It's presented, and you experience it, as a consideration, right? something to take into consideration. Maybe a very strong consideration, a very powerful consideration, or, or it may not, but that's all it is. And there may be other considerations in play. So you decide which reasons to act on and which ones to ignore and which ones to reject and override and which ones to, 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 to try to ignore 
generally in the future, and which ones you only want to override in this case because of some other strong reason that's in play. So reasons are presented to you and experienced as things uh, that you have the freedom to respond to in one way or another, and that's what makes them reasons. Uh, and that, thinks Sartre, is how we experience the world as a sets of considerations that we have to weigh up and decide between. And it's that weighing up and deciding that is the process of reaffirming or revising the underlying projects or values that give those reasons their strength, right? So if we if we decide to override a, a reason that still somehow seems quite powerful, what we're effectively doing is beginning to undermine our project or value which, which had given that reason its strength in the first place. And that's a feature of Sartre's theory of freedom which Merleau-Ponty doesn't engage with either. Um, good, so that's that. I hope this uh, film has helped to make clearer exactly what is going on in Sartre's theory uh, of existentialism, what makes it the theory that it is, as well as uh, showing you why I think that Merleau-Ponty's criticism fails. Uh, I do think there's something very important in Merleau-Ponty's theory of motivation and um, and freedom uh, in that passage, in that chapter of phenomenology of perception, which I haven't talked about so far. And that's the, the comments on sedimentation, what he calls sedimentation. Um, but I, I also think that uh, in terms of a, a criticism of Sartre's existentialism, that idea of sedimentation is actually much better developed, uh, not by Merleau-Ponty in that book, but by Simone de Beauvoir uh, in her earlier novel, uh, She Came to Stay, or L'Invité, which was published in 1943, the same year as Being in Nothingness, and again in, uh, in The Second Sex. Um, but all of that uh, is for the next film. So stay tuned for another exciting instalment.